Hello, I'm Rachel Liebman and I'm a doctor working in a hospital in Sussex, the Queen Victoria Hospital in East Grinstead, and I'm a pathologist. Histopathology is my specialty and I'm vice president of the Royal College of Pathologists, um, which means I was elected by a ballot of our 11,000 members. I'm delighted to be here today to be able to talk to you about careers in pathology and to let you hear from some of my colleagues in some of the pathology disciplines about what they do in their hospital and in their labs. You may have seen some pathologists in television programmes like Midsummer Murders or CSI or Silent Witness. A recent survey showed that 60% of people believe that pathologists only cut up dead bodies and about a third of people were completely unaware that pathologists had anything to do with the diagnosing diseases in, in living people. So although pathology is often associated with autopsies or post-mortems, that's a misconception. Pathology is the study of disease. So many of the major advances in medicine have been made in the medical practice which is associated with laboratory medicine or pathology. For example, immunization against infectious diseases, organ transplantation, and safe blood transfusion. So those are just some examples of where pathologists um, interact with patients and where pathologists have been at the cutting edge of medicine. So a histopathologist looks at tissues and cells down the microscope and they use a trained eye to assess whether these tissues that have been removed in the clinic at biopsy or in the operating theatre to assess whether there's disease present and then to advise on what course of action needs to be taken next. Histopathologists are the people who diagnose diseases that are um, sometimes cancers or other serious illnesses, but they also quite often will give good news. For example, if a lump or a mole is benign and nothing to worry about at all. And some histopathologists will do autopsies in order to find out why someone died. My name is Dr Mark Howard. I'm a consultant histopathologist at King's College Hospital in London. Histopathology is one of the medical specialties which not everyone knows about, but a lot of people have had an um, unknowing to them experience of what we do here in the hospital. It's the study of cells and cellular material, usually to make diagnosis um, of diseases and conditions. We also work very closely with our colleagues in surgery and oncology, radiology, in terms of both analysing the tissue and helping guide the oncologists in particular in the best ways of treating things such as cancer. We now need to find out what was the actual cause of the reason for the lack of blood supply and then we'll create our report and feed it back to the surgeons. Uh, histopathology is an extremely important specialty. I know everyone who is in whatever specialty say their specialty is very important but we support a huge range of patients through their patient journey. So very, very many of the patients that come to our hospital will have biopsies or have operations where tissue is removed. And it's our responsibility to examine that tissue, make the diagnosis, and I say work with our colleagues in the other specialties to make sure those patients don't just get the best treatment, but they get personalized treatment um, so that the outcome for the patient is the absolute best it can be. So these are our patients in histopathology. These are our patients. We care much about them being glass sides as members of the A&E department do about the patients in A&E or the ITU care about the ITU patients. Um, so although we're one physical step removed from the actual patients, they are with us in this form and this is where we do our medicine. So I work with the whole hospital essentially. There's, there's hardly a, 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 an area of the hospital we don't work with very closely. In terms of my own department, um, I work with about 40, 50 people um, regularly and that's, that's a whole range of, of people with very different skill sets. So the secretarial support staff, the laboratory staff, the molecular scientists, people in the mortuary, people in the bereavement office, my colleagues who I work with all the time, the registrars who are training, the training grade doctors. So it's, it's a really wide spectrum of people that, that we work with. The case will then go off to the multidisciplinary team meeting so that it can be discussed between the pathologists, the oncologists, the radiologists and the physicians as well and a, a plan for this patient will be put together and put into action and the patient will be seen back in clinic in, in a few days after that and treatment will start. Yeah. Oh, you, you don't need it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
who work particularly closely with the advanced diagnostics team, um, medicine and histopathology in particular has, has really moved into the 21st century. And we now talk as we do about personalised molecular medicine. So if someone has a bowel tumour, has a lung cancer, we don't just diagnose it as a lung cancer and they get, everyone gets the same treatment. Um, the team here will run highly sophisticated molecular and immunohistochemical analyses on that to determine exactly what type of lung cancer there it is and what it's what we call molecular signature, is that just correct? My favourite bit of the job, so what is my favourite bit of histopathology? The fact it's never the same. It's never the same uh, on two days and you don't know what's coming your way. Um, and it, it's endlessly fascinating. Uh, I learn every day things. Um, hopefully I don't learn too many new things every day, but I do learn new things at least every week, um, which is healthy. Uh, it challenges me. It means I have to bring all the skills and skill set that I have to bear. Um, and I like the fact it makes me um, a good team player because uh, histopathology you work as a team and you work as a group. So we constantly spend our time showing each other cases, discussing cases, um, really fascinating areas of research to be involved with, teaching, educating medical students, teaching our registrars. So although our week has a rotor to it, which looks relatively similar, sort of week by week, if you go hour by hour or day by day, it's very, very different. Uh, Ali, what, what are your thoughts looking at this um, lymph node? Um, tips for medical students uh, what, wondering about coming into histopathology, I think come talk to us. Come and talk to us. Um, come and find out what we do. There's always opportunities to come and see what we do in the laboratory. There's always opportunities to get involved in research. Um, it's a really, really varied work, work and uh, life being a histopathologist. It's not just looking down the microscope, it's about patient interaction, it's about many interactions with clinical colleagues, um, and it's, it's a hugely satisfying and enjoyable uh, discipline to be part of, and I, I feel very honoured that, um, that I've been able to do that. So the skills that you need to be a histopathologist include having a really good eye for detail and for patterns, being able to make decisions under pressure because you will be asked to decide whether or not this lump is a benign lump, nothing to worry about, or whether it's cancer and all of the implications that come on from that. You need good communication skills because if you're not sure and not all things are straightforward in life. So you need to be able to communicate with the clinical teams that you're pretty sure, but you'd like them to take another biopsy so that you can be absolutely sure and to do the extra diagnostic tests that are needed, you might need more tissue. And some of those interactions can be really quite complicated. And definitely you need to be able to work as part of a team in the laboratory and within the wider hospital. So I'm going to pause now and ask you a question. Can you put your hands up if you've ever had a blood test? Okay, perhaps it's better if I ask who hasn't had a blood test, they think. Okay, were you born in this country, the ones who don't think they've had a blood test? Yeah? So anybody who's been born in this country has had a blood test because within a few days of birth, you will have what's called a heel prick test and the baby's tiny little drop of blood from their heel will be put on a card and that card is analyzed in a pathology laboratory looking for inherited diseases that need to be treated quickly in order for that baby not to develop really serious complications. And so this country has a really good system of carrying out a blood test within a few days and weeks of having been born. So one of the pathology disciplines that looks at blood in particular um, is haematology. And haematologists study and treat diseases of blood cells and bone marrow. And they also treat blood clotting abnormalities. And they're responsible for ensuring that blood transfusions are safe. So they'll look after people who have anemia, leukemias, thrombosis, and bleeding problems such as haemophilia. And they work in laboratories diagnosing disease, but they also work in the wards and in clinics caring directly with patients. So I'm a haematology consultant. Haematologists are specialist doctors who look after and investigate 
conditions that are associated with blood problems and also bone marrow problems which is the factory where um, all the blood cells are made. So this can include conditions like anemia, leukemia, um, where you have too many um, white blood cells, a type of blood cell cancer, um, but also clotting problems where the blood's not sticky enough, like haemophilia, or when the blood's too sticky and patients can develop clots. Anne and I are just going to review a blood film of uh, one of our haematology patients who's had some changes in their blood count from um, their normal and we need to have a look at the cells and make sure that their disease hasn't become more aggressive and changed into something like leukaemia. I like the balance between um, looking after patients and also spending time in the laboratory. What I particularly like about haematology is that you can do a lot of um, things yourself. Um, so you can see the patient, um, take their blood sample up to the laboratory, look at the um, numbers that run in your lab, look at the cells under the microscope and come to a diagnosis. And then say if a patient needed to have their clinical appointment brought forward, Shardae and I would have a look on my clinic lists and see where we have space and where we can slot that patient in. With um, direct, what we call direct patient care, direct patient contact, probably about 80% of my time is spent doing that. Um, we have on-call rotors for um, attending on the wards where we do our ward rounds. Um, but we'll also sometimes go and see patients, either if they're our own, our own specific patients or um, if there's a specific query that perhaps we've been asked to answer by one of our colleagues and we'll go and see the patients on the ward then. So normally you do two to three ward rounds a week when you're attending, sometimes more depending if there are patients who are unwell or um, who need input. So another part of the job um, is that I come and see patients here on our day unit. So um, as I've a doctor with a red cell interest, our day unit is specifically for patients with red cell disorders. So that's people with um, thalassemia and sickle cell disease. So I'm just off to do a couple of reviews of um, a couple of my patients. So um, a patient who um, had is a young girl with thalassemia. Um, so thalassemia is an inherited blood condition that's present from birth and requires transfusions to sustain life. Unfortunately, this girl um, has had um, significant reactions to her blood transfusions, which you know is is a creates a sort of a critical problem. She needs these transfusions to survive, but the transfusions, if anything, are making her quality of life worse and we can um, set up um, a special panel in conjunction with the UK Thalassemia um, Society which is a um, patient organisation to get experts from all over the world to take advice on this um, girl's case and we've started a variety of new therapies and they have seem to have really improved her reactions to her blood transfusion to the degree where she's thinking about going back and completing her PhD. So this is Emma Prescott, who's my specialist nurse, who um, is my thalassemia clinical nurse specialist and plays a massive part in keeping our patients well looked after. <laughs> so one of the great things about haematology is the long-term relationship we have with our patients. Um, we can know them from sort of birth all the way throughout their entire lives. So you do really know everything about them, you know, you know their family circumstances, you um, see them as a whole, not just as a diagnosis. What's particularly rewarding is when you have a patient come to see you in clinic who's perhaps been really unwell on the wards and has got better and is telling you how much better they're feeling. And that's, you know, that's the best feeling in the world. If people um, have developed a reaction to um, blood transfusion, then um, we do what's called a DAT test, which is a special type of blood test, which is looking to see if there's um, any of the antibody on the surface of the red blood cells. So haematology is a great career, um, I'd strongly recommend it to anyone. I think you can make it what you what you like, even within haematology there's so many different subspecialities that it really is like a, you know, the world's your oyster.
the skills that you need to be a good haematologist and these skills are brought together by asking the committee um, that represents haematology at the college and asking them, asking real haematologists what skills they think are needed. And so they've described interpersonal skills, being able to empathise the patients, interpretive skills and good written communication skills. So when you look at blood, it's got two components. It's got the cells in it, which is what the haematologists are mainly interested in, but it's also got the chemistry. How many of you here are studying chemistry A-level? Nearly everybody. So when you apply chemistry to the human body in healthcare, it's called either chemical pathology or clinical biochemistry, and the two are, are used interchangeably and are almost synonymous. And those pathologists will diagnose diseases which occurs when the body's chemistry goes wrong. So they'll test body fluids, mainly blood, but also urine, saliva, spinal fluid. And they work in the lab, but they will also, again, see patients they have an important clinical role. They will spend time looking at the patient's test results to see what's normal and what's abnormal. And abnormal results will be discussed with the patient's doctor. My name is Joanne Morris, and I'm consultant clinical scientist. So my specialty is clinical biochemistry. Uh, in clinical biochemistry, we uh, diagnose and manage disease in patients by analysing body fluids. Uh, so we mostly look at the fluid part of blood, but we also look at urine and spinal fluid and sometimes even saliva. Um, we test for numerous things. We look for proteins, uh, enzymes, hormones, uh, vitamins, and what we do is we look at the patterns of the test results uh, to tell us why a patient is feeling unwell. You bring me, you bring me the patient details and I'll have a look um, and see what, if they've, got, if they've got any previous. I think we provide really vital information that help doctors make diagnosis uh, of disease in patients. It's really important because that allows them to make sure that patients receive the correct treatment. Um, we also do things like, uh, we, we do tests that help doctors decide if a patient is well enough to receive treatments and also if that treatment is effective. So for example, patients who are undergoing chemotherapy. Um, the laboratory can also provide results very quickly um, and that allows doctors in critical situations where patients are acutely unwell to act quickly and save lives. Hello, my name is Joanne Morris. I'm calling from the pathology department at the Whittington Hospital. I have some critically abnormal results on the patient. We're very much a support and advisory service for medical professionals. Uh, so we will do things like, uh, we will look at patterns of results um, and we look for particular patterns that help with diagnosing a patient's illness. So one particular case that's stuck in my mind is a number of years ago, I had very high potassium result on a patient at about seven o'clock on a Friday evening. Um, it was a patient uh, from a GP and the GP surgery was closed. Uh, it took me about an hour of phoning round to find an on-call doctor um, that was able to take the result. Um, so a high potassium will affect how your heart beats, it affects the electrical rhythms in your heart, uh, it's extremely dangerous and life threatening. So the uh, doctor phoned for an ambulance for the patient um, and as the patient was coming into A&E they actually had a cardiac event in the ambulance. Had they not been in the ambulance they wouldn't have survived um, and I found out about this because the patient's daughter actually phoned the lab on Monday morning to thank me because her father lived on his own and uh, he didn't let survive. So I work in a blood sciences department, so that includes clinical biochemistry, haematology and blood transfusion. Um, in biochemistry, there's myself and one other clinical scientist. We have three haematology doctors and about 26 biomedical scientist staff and about 30 medical laboratory assistants, so we're quite a lot. Uh, generally, we would be talking about patient samples, results that have come through that are abnormal. The favourite bit of my job, uh, I've probably got two favourite bits of my job actually. So, um, teaching, I love teaching, I find that really rewarding. 
um, and really interesting and it, you always learn something as you teach other people. Um, and I also enjoy the clinical interaction, so talking to doctors, um, particularly when they've got a difficult patient that they've spent a lot of time trying to work out what's wrong with them and um, they'll talk to you and suddenly you get that light bulb moment where you realise exactly what's wrong with that patient and you can then suggest a test that will make a final diagnosis. So I've got a young family and I've worked flexibly since my eldest child was born. Um, I think the NHS is generally a family friendly employer and I've been very, very fortunate that I've had senior colleagues during my training who've been very supportive in allowing me to continue my career um, and I get a good amount of time at home with my family and with my children. So I'm a very passionate advocate of the NHS. I think the fact that this country has a uh, healthcare system which is free at the point of access to everybody is a really important thing and I think it's a real privilege to be able to do a job that helps people. Um, so, and I just, I love the fact that I learn something new every day and no two days are ever the same. So, the skills that the chemical pathologists or clinical biochemists have told us are important for their specialty include communication skills, having an eye for detail, leadership skills, and organisational skills. So, the last of the four big specialties in pathology that I want to talk about today is medical microbiology. And I know that even at primary school level now, the syllabus, the curriculum, contains a section on microbes. And so most of you will have a fairly good idea what we mean by microbes, but medical microbiology is the science that goes on in hospitals whenever those microbes are actually causing disease. So medical microbiologists mainly work in the labs, but they now see patients as well. They will give advice on infection control issues. As you know, there are an awful lot of infections that are now resistant to the antibiotics that we've traditionally used and we are running out of even the most expensive, even the most rare antibiotics to be able to treat some of the um, diseases. And so we risk going back to a situation like they had before penicillin was invented. And that's where being really cautious and careful about antibiotic use is really important and our medical microbiologists are pathologists that are really important in that work. They give advice on the correct treatment but they also are important in combating antimicrobial resistance because they'll make sure that antibiotics aren't used for virus infections, for example, where they won't make any difference at all. They collaborate with colleagues and they deal directly with patients as well as working in the lab. And they can make new and unexpected discoveries which will impact on the patient's health. So I'm a, I'm a medical doctor and I work as a consultant medical microbiologist and that means that my role is to, to diagnose, treat and prevent infection caused by microorganisms. So those are bacteria, viruses, fungi and parasites. It's got lots of positive cultures, mm. so they've repeated that. They would repeat it after one dose of caproxene. Microbiology is incredibly important. We're surrounded, we live in a microbial world. We're covered in bugs, we have microbes inside us, and the environment's full of microorganisms. And infection affects every single one of us. This is one of the best bits of the job. Dealing with a patient, someone who's sick, wondering what might be wrong, starting best guess antibiotics, and then coming in the next day and, and having a look and seeing what's growing. No two days are ever the same because actually you never quite know what's going to grow. But a typical day, uh, will be 9 to 5.30. We, we start the day with a, with a handover from colleagues who are on over the weekend or overnight. And then we'll usually have a clinical or educational meeting in the morning. Then the rest of the morning is spent undertaking laboratory liaison where we uh, find out what's growing and whether we need to do any further work to, to identify bacteria or what's growing in the lab. Um, we'll then go and 
see patients um, at the bedside and do the intensive care ward round as well as phone out um, or authorise those important results to the teams who are waiting for those results. In the afternoon we may have a team meeting, for example infection control uh, or I would for example have the antimicrobial stewardship team meeting and uh, we also take the time to do teaching sessions that might be lectures to undergraduate medical students. Are you happy that we read it? What would you read that at? So, yes, actually, microbiologists have a lot of patient contact. We uh, see um, all the patients on the intensive care unit every day, so we conduct a ward round daily. And we also go and review patients with difficult or complex infections uh, at the bedside. Colleagues who are also trained in infectious diseases or those who deliver outpatient um, antimicrobial therapy services, they run weekly clinics. So we have regular patient contact and daily uh, intensive care ward rounds. I think when you actually go to the bedside, meet the patient, it really helps put the pieces together. You actually get to understand the impact of the infection and seeing people get better, seeing the effects of your, uh, your, your advice or your diagnosis, your therapy, actually making things better for patients. It really does. Um, when I'm at work, I'm really busy, I never notice the time, but then I think there is that lovely chance to step away because you know you've done a good job, you've had a lot of um, job satisfaction when you're there, and you can step away and switch off um, as a microbiologist. Uh, you're on call, but that's often from home, so it's very manageable with a family life as well. And I find personally that I can really enjoy the time I'm at work, but also unwind and switch off enjoy my family and friends when I'm away from work. I actually work less than full time as do some other colleagues in my department and that's very achievable and it really works particularly well for microbiology because we don't have our own inpatients because we serve all patients we can we can work out rotors that work for people and also fit in their other interests to make sure that that division of care is very equal. I'll admit I love I love the subject it, it endlessly interests me. I, I never get bored um, with with dealing with infection and, and bugs. So the subject I really enjoy. But I think the really the best part for me is working with with colleagues. Um, that's both inside the department and across the hospital. I find it really stimulating. I learn such a lot from from dealing with uh, my colleagues and speaking to them and working with them. It's very rewarding. And of course. I feel in my job I can really fulfil my vocation. I really do think that we're making a difference and, it's, and that's, that gives me great job satisfaction as well. So I, I really do enjoy what I do. There you go, there's something. <laughs>
So I've given you an introduction, and my colleagues have given you an introduction to four of the pathology specialties. There's actually 17 specialties in pathology. So my college will deal with immunology, with veterinary pathology. So if you want to be a vet, you can then specialize in um, pathology as well. Oral pathology, so these are people who qualify as dentists and then go into pathology. And things like neuropathology. And only about 1% of our pathologists work in forensic pathology. So can I have a guess as to how many biochemistry tests are performed in the UK each year? Yes, the back? 100 million is not bad. More than that, actually. It's 400 million biochemistry tests in the UK every year. How many haematology tests? Now that's 120 million haematology tests, 30 million microbiology tests, 13 million histopathology slides, and the expense for healthcare spent on pathology. So it's going to sound like a very large number, it's 2.5 billion pounds. But when you think that pathology makes up 10% of the NHS's workforce, you can see that that expenditure is actually not that high. And when you think that it's 14 tests for everybody in the population, you can see that actually that's, that, that works out at being a reasonable amount. And some of our pathology tests are really quite cheap, straightforward to do, and others are really very expensive. And it very much depends on the illness. And so you will hear people talk a lot about um, specialised medicine, talking about um, personalised medicine. But when you think about it, medicine's always been personalised. We've never just said, ah, yes, you're ill, so here's our one medicine. Well, not since the days of snake oil salesmen. We actually tailor the treatment to the patient and what's wrong with them, and we always have. But we've got lots and lots more technologies that we can use to do that now. And um, we can get even more specific to that disease on that day in that patient. So I'm looking at the time. It is five past four. I've got another video to show, and then we'll have some questions. But just to say that if you want to find out about careers in pathology some more, we have a lot of information on the college website. And on the table outside, there are some cards which have the website address, the actual link on them. So please, please take one um, as you go. So this video is called The Journey of a Biopsy. And it shows you what happens in a laboratory if you have a biopsy taken, either in an outpatient clinic or at endoscopy or from the theatre. My name's Lorette Folks. I'm a consultant histopathologist. If you find that you've got a lump, for example, in your breast or just not feeling quite right and you've had imaging and they find that there's a mass growing in your body, the clinicians might have an idea roughly about what it might be, but you don't necessarily know for sure what it is, so it has to have a biopsy. Most people know what a biopsy is. Most patients don't know what's happened, what happens to it once it has been taken. Often they, the surgeon will present them with the result, and I don't think they probably think how that result has been has come about. My name is Sarah, and I'm an advanced biomedical support worker. Uh, when the biopsy arrives, if it's a urgent specimen, we might prioritise it. Um, and then we book it in. You learn a lot about anatomy, and that's what I find really interesting. My name is Abed Arnu. I'm a consultant histopathologist working at St. George's Hospital. If you follow me here, I'll show you. Once all these specimens are checked in, in the reception, they all come here to the cut-up room. You can have biopsies, you can have excisions, small excisions, or you can have big resections. Consultants cannot really do everything. So what we do is we train biomedical scientists to dissect some small specimens that may not be cancerous. Pathology is a challenging job, you know. It's a job that, uh, that, that, that based on, your, on what you say, you are really helping the patient. My name is Sarah and I'm a BMS dissector. I cut up category B and C specimens. So that means that they are smaller specimens that BMS dissectors have recently been trained to do. Normally pathologists used to do that in the past, but um, they're training by medical scientists at certain levels to do it now. And we measure them and then we um, 
slice them and embed, usually we embed most of the material into cassettes. Every day I have to ask a question. You know, I've been doing this for almost two years and I'm about to sit my exam, but I'm always there. My name is Marius Azhari and I'm a specialist biomedical scientist. Once the tissues uh, have been dissected, then they go into processing. And what that means is any water content in those tissues are, is removed and is replaced by wax under high pressure. And this is what processing does. It removes water content from the tissue and impregnates it with wax. Once the tissues have been removed from the processor, here is the, a cassette that contains a processed tissue. And you can see the water content has been removed and it's very hard. So what I do is I get a metal mold, just like this one. I put a bit of molten paraffin wax and leave it on the cold plate to cool down. One that I've left earlier, you can see that the wax has hardened and this is the end result. It's, uh, this is what we call embedding. The tissue is embedded inside the hard wax and that protects the tissue and it covers it and uh, preserves it in that state. I obviously enjoy science and uh, enjoy the human pathology and uh, I think this is as uh, close as it gets to uh, dealing with human tissue. My name is Evangelos Kariankidis. I'm a biomedical scientist. So the sample arrives in a, a wax block. So once it comes here, what we do is uh, we have to slice it into very thin sections, we call them. Um, these sections tend to be about three microns. And basically, you just turn the handle and it, it, it moves up and down through the blades and, and you get slices of wax uh, with tissue in it. This is like a razor blade, and so we're cutting here, you know, the thickness of here, but smaller than that. So this has to be very thin because you want to be able to see through it at some point, so, um, which you'll see in the next stage. You do help a lot of people, and it's a very satisfying way of, of doing something. Each block is important to somebody, like each tissue that comes in and basically geared to get that to, done as fast as possible because people are waiting for results. Hi, my name is Penel and I'm a biomedical scientist. So when we collected about two or three racks, we load them onto the staining machine. We do a simple staining. The samples need to be stained because we need to see the tissue cells under the microscope and it's more visible. The end product would be like this. So you can see different shades of pink and purple. I'm Sadia, I'm an advanced practitioner. So at this stage of quality control, we're making sure that what's on the slide matches what's on the form. Quality control is making sure that section is of good quality, the staining is of good quality. We have to make sure that what's actually on the slide is representing the patient. Once the case has been checked out by us, it will then get released to the consultant. So the flies that have been made in the laboratory are picked up by consultants and then we have a look at them on the microscope here to diagnose the disease. So actually, clinically, the, the dermatologist thought it was a BCC, but um, she's not absolutely sure. It could, it could be a melanoma or it could be something else. And so she's taken, they've cut it out and then they sent it to us to um, be absolutely sure. So I'll confirm, yes, this is a basal cell carcinoma. And then my job is to then tell her what type of basal cell carcinoma, because different cancers can be not very aggressive or very aggressive. So our job is to tell them whether it is aggressive or not and whether they've cut it all out. It's a sort of a detective job, really. Sometimes you can spend three hours on one case because one case could have up to 50, 60 slides. You've got to work through all of those and, and then write a report. So that can take three hours, whereas something like this can just take a few minutes. The final stage of the biopsy journey is when you hear back your results. So I hope the next time you have a biopsy you remember all the people involved in producing that report. So we now have time for some questions and I'd be really, really happy to take your questions and answer them as, as, as well as I can about any of the pathology disciplines. Um, but please bear in mind that I'm a histopathologist, so that's the area that I feel most confident about, but really happy to take your questions. Any questions from the floor? Yes. So say you were to review a slide and you would find that it's something that you have no idea at all and you've never experienced it before, and what would the protocol be in that scenario? 
Okay, so that does happen. Um, so in my workload, um, just as my colleague was saying about um, histopathology and everyday learning something, most of the cases you've seen before and you can quite readily diagnose them, but we definitely, at least once a day, have a case which we think, I've never seen anything like this before, or I've seen something like this before, but it's really tricky because it's in a gray area between benign and malignant, or a gray area between pre-cancer and invasive cancer. And so there are several things that we can do. If we start with the simple things, we can go back to the tissue, which you saw being dissected, and we can take more tissue just within the pathology laboratory, not involving the patient, so that we've got a second look at it. So a slightly different part of the same, um, the same tumor, for example. Or we can do what we call extra levels. So you saw the tissue being sliced really thinly. Remember, it looked, it looked a bit like gold leaf or tissue paper, just one th um, film. So we can take some more of those because that's just a sample and it's only at one level, so we can go deeper and have a look at more. We have the usual um, stains that we use so that we can see the tissue down the microscope. It's called a hematoxylin and eosin, H and E stain, and that stains things that pink and purple color. It separates the nucleus from the rest of the cell when we're looking down the microscope. But we have other stains that we can use, and that will really help. So if we think that there's maybe been some previous hemorrhage, or it might be melanin because it might be a melanoma, we can tell the difference between the two by doing a pearl stain, which stains iron, a really dark black. So we can do lots of t different tests. And then there are even more tests we can do, which are called immunohistochemistry tests, which use antigens and antibodies, and the reaction of that in that tissue on a slide, and we can do that to help us find out what it is. And finally, if you still don't know, it's like, who wants to be a millionaire? You phone a friend, and you ask a, an expert in your field who you know will have seen lots of these because they work somewhere where there's lots of them that come through their, their work. And so I will frequently send cases to experts somewhere else in the UK, but I might even send them overseas to whoever is the leading person so that the patient here in the NHS gets the very best diagnosis for their case because I've recognized that it's really unusual and that I haven't seen enough of it. But I know that someone else has written up a series of say 20 of them and so I'll ask that person for their advice. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes. Any other questions? Yes. Is there any overlap between the work done by the medical microbiologists and the immunologists? There is overlap in, for quite a few of our pathology specialties. Um, I think the medical microbiology immunology f interface would be quite often things like um, if you're looking at an inflammatory response or an immune response to an infection, or if you're looking things at things which we, we're not quite sure what causes the disease, so there's still some diseases and we're not sure whether they are an autoimmune reaction or whether they're infection. And, and we're still investigating them and we're, we're doing lots and lots of um, additional um, research into looking at them. So yes, there is overlap in quite a few areas. And quite often, even when I'm doing my histopathology, I will see bugs down the microscope. And so I might make an infectious diagnosis, even though I'm not a medical microbiologist, but just because I recognize that, for example, there might be candida in a biopsy. And so we will say it's quite common in oral pathology that you'll find candida, and it might be the problem. And you'll feed that back, and people might get an antifungal. And then if they still have symptoms, they may get another biopsy, um, or they may be completely treated and be well then after that. Anyone else? Yes. How would you go about becoming a pathologist? Is there a course or a set of courses you were expected to do? Yes. Um, so I chose to become a pathologist because when I was at medical school, um, we were offered the opportunity to do an intercalated degree. And in most medical schools now, those are offered. Um, and in some, it's even expected. But in my medical school days, it was offered and only a few people took it up. Um, but I decided to do an intercalated degree in pathology. And I decided to do that because you'll find if you get, do get into medicine and you do it, that, that medicine is, an, to a certain extent, it's an introductory course in lots of different aspects of healthcare. So it's an introductory course in anatomy, biochemistry, pharmacology, and pathology. And I wanted to go a bit deeper than that and so an intercalated degree allows you to go a bit deeper and learn something at a much deeper level and you get an extra qualification 
So when we were offered the opportunity to do it in pathology, I volunteered to do it in pathology. And by the end of the year, I was completely hooked. I loved it. Um, I loved the microscopy. I realized that it was something that I could do. I was not quite instinctive. You do learn it, and, and you need the experience. But it was me and my microscope against the world, and I really, really enjoyed it. And so by the end of that, I knew I wanted to be a pathologist. So then after you've done your general medical school, um, and these days it's called foundation training. So there's two years of foundation training where you're on the wards. It's the most junior doctor on the wards. And then after that, you apply to get into specialist training if you want to be a histopathologist. For some of our pathology specialties, you then do some core training in medicine and then go in at a later date. So, for example, medical microbiology and hematology and chemical pathology, uh, those people will have done core medical training because those skills are important because they will be seeing patients in the wards and they will need to have those core medical skills before they then go in and do their pathology training. So there is, and there's a very defined curriculum that you then follow in a defined training course before you sit the Royal College of Pathologists exams and hopefully finish as a qualified um, pathologist and eligible to apply for consultant posts. So it's quite a long training program, but it's shorter than quite a lot of the medical training programs that are out there. Yes. So the question was, what makes histopathology more rewarding from my point of view? Yeah. Well, there are so many things that I like about it. As I said, it was my, me and my microscope against the world. Um, but also, I'm one of these people that quite likes to have the answer before other people have the answer. So as I said, it's important that we can make a decision. But once I've made that decision about what's what is wrong with that person and is in their biopsy. I know that information before their surgeon, before their physician, before their GP, before their anaesthetist. I'm the one that knows that and I really quite like that. And if you go to a multidisciplinary team meeting whenever you um, um, are in your medical school training, you'll see that they all turn towards the histopathologist for the answer as to what's wrong. So the radiologists will get close to it. They'll say, ah, the lesion is in the chest, in this area of the chest. But whether the lesion is cancer or not is the pathologist. And I really quite like that. So that was what made it really rewarding for me. Um, but lots of people go into it for different reasons. The people in the videos have mentioned that um, there's the possibility of um, working flexibly. And so I worked flexibly for several years whenever my children were small. And I think that that's one of the attractions of a pathology career. Histopathology in particular tends not to have on-call rotas. So again, you'll have heard about junior doctors. Well, junior doctors in histopathology will work. Um, they will work very, very hard in the laboratory during the day, but they will not be on call in the evening at all. And so again, that was attractive because I wanted a family. And I wanted a family at the, the sort of age where other people were having to try to juggle um, rotas and childcare. And very, very difficult. Um, so there are lots and lots of things that attract different people. Um, and we get people coming into pathology specialties sometimes who have done other careers. And then they realize they're particularly interested in one aspect of it. And then they come into pathology at a later stage. So it isn't a once and once only. You do get other opportunities to think about your career options and to think about coming in. So I've talked very much about my journey and that because I'm a medical doctor that started with medical school but just please remember that if you are doing a science degree at university you can also be a pathologist so one-fifth of our college members are not medical they are clinical scientists and the um, chemical pathologist that you saw here today um, is a clinical scientist a clinical biochemist and so she will have done a degree possibly biochemistry and then will have um, come into the health service and done her training as she worked in the health service. And that route is every bit as valid and leads to a consultant post at the end. And then there are jobs within the laboratory that are the biomedical scientists. You met lots of different people at different stages in the journey of the biopsy. And those scientists work in all of the pathology laboratories doing hugely important work. And so Again, if people are um, interested in science, interested in working in pathology, but don't want to do medicine, there's opportunities there as well. 
So I think I'll take one more question, if there are any, and then we'll wrap it up. Anyone else? At the back, yes. How do pathologists like, think that they're going to combat antibiotic-resistant diseases in the future? So, well, one of the things that pathologists can do to combat it is making sure that the right antibiotic is used and that antibiotics are not used for viral diseases. So an example of a really important development that we now have is rapid turnaround flu testing. Because if you know that the person has flu, that is a viral illness, and that person does not need and shouldn't get antibiotics unless they get an additional bacterial infection over the top, which can happen. But by making sure that that diagnosis is correct at the beginning, you can stop people being given antibiotics who don't need it and who just increase that background level of antibiotic resistant organisms out there in the environment, which is so, so very dangerous. And it's particularly dangerous in hospital because you've got people who are already ill for other reasons because of their illness. And then if they come in contact with an antibiotic resistant organism, they can't fight it. And we don't have the antibiotics anymore to fight it. So that's one of the things that, that pathologists very much are doing is giving that, that advice and making sure those diagnoses are happening on time. So we're always working to get new tests and to get them to the right patients at the right time so that we can keep those antibiotics in reserve, the really, really powerful ones, we can keep them in reserve for, for when we need them because nothing else is going to work. So thank you very much. You've been a fantastic audience. It's been really, really stimulating. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. We'll be around. There are, as I say, there are careers materials outside. I'm here if you want to come up and ask me any questions on a one-to-one -one basis. And please feel free to contact the college and we will help you in any way that we can. And um, your local hospital, if you say I'm particularly interested in doing some work experience in the pathology laboratory, they will quite often be very happy to help you and to help you find that, um, that attachment. So please feel free. Thank you very much indeed.